I think it's appropriate as we begin our class time together that let's pray, all right? Father in heaven, this morning as we are uh, in a class setting, I pray that you will open our eyes and our hearts to new insights, remind us of things that we need to be reminded of, and further develop in our hearts and our minds a, a closer understanding of your word and a closer walk with you. Help us to apply the things that we're going to uh, discuss today on an individual basis as we explore your word for ourselves, as well as to help other people to know you. Help us to go way beyond just understanding and help us to go into application. Uh, And we pray that you will uh, use today to glorify you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we approach scripture, what are some basic questions you should be interested in discovering? You read Bible. We're going to be preaching through the go- the gospel. It is a gospel. We're going to be preaching through the book of Hebrews. And when I say the gospel, obviously your mind immediately thinks Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. But the gospel, the good news, does not stop at the resurrection of Jesus and your personal baptism. Would you agree with that? I'm going to suggest it this way. Good news does not stop at the water. It continues on because good news is the blood of Jesus continues to cleanse. We continue to have fellowship with one another. The promises of God are still active today in our lives as we claim our walk with him by faith to walk hand in hand with Jesus through this world. He is our Lord, our King, our brother, our shepherd, our head, the high priest. We see him Jesus and our relationship with him. So um, we begin asking these five basic questions, and this is pretty much where we, where we are on our prep and delivery of babies. Number one question. As I state this, I don't want to just read the question. I want us to discuss some of the things. So let's look at what does this passage say about the Father, about the Son, and about the Holy Spirit. With respect to this first question, what is the basic assumption of the question? There are at least two or three basic assumptions that are made before we ever ask the question. So what is the, I'm going to say, what is the biblical or the spiritual reality behind the question, what does this text say, reveal about the Father, about the Son, about the Holy Spirit. One of the three or all three, yes. A presumption is that from a Christian worldview that the text itself is already inspired by the Spirit. It's already what? Inspired by the Spirit. Okay, number one, it's inspired by the Spirit, the text we're looking at. So we can assume that it says something about the inspiration of the Spirit. And by inspiration of the Spirit, one of the questions might be, Why did the Holy Spirit include this passage in this space to this group of original readers or hearers as the word was written? By the way, the Bible was written not for the eye, but for the ear. It's written, hear me again, the Bible is written not for the eye, but for the ear. What do you think I mean by that? Okay, that's, that would be the application of that, right? We read it aloud. So let me step back and tell you something that's brand new to me. <laughs> I don't mean to say that is in such a surprising way. Wow, look at me. I just learned something brand new. I learn something new all the time. But this is something that is absolutely brand new to me in the last few years. years but especially as I've been preparing for the book of Hebrews. My role... And helping us in the book of Hebrews is to schedule it out. Who's not who's going to preach when, but what are we going to preach when? Scheduling out the Hebrews letter. And as we schedule out the Hebrews letter, we're beginning with page 1 to page 13. And we're going to go in order, chronological. It's not a hodgepodge of pick out your favorite part of Hebrews and preach on it, like what we've done in John, but rather work our way through Hebrews How many lessons can you preach 
from or teach from the book, the gospel of Hebrews? A lot. A whole lot. My grandfather preached an entire year through Hebrews. That'd be 52 sermons, and he included some classes. Yes. In preparation for my upcoming lesson, yes, I'm running into a lot of scripture which states, have they not read? And I think that reinforces what we need to do each and every day. And I know Gene often refers to, well, in my daily reading, I've come across this or that. So a lot of times in our reading, we'll reinforce these questions. Yes. And we'll develop, you know, it's kind of selfish, but I ask the question, what's in it for me? You ought to ask it. Every time you read scripture, exactly. what's in it for me? And everyone is tuned in to that radio station, WIIFM, what's in it for me? Right? Everyone is. So you need to be aware of that as you're preaching because they're li everyone else is listening for that as well. What you're saying, how does it apply to my life? Right? So there, is there something selfish about that? I guess in a sense, because you want to apply it to yourself, but it's not selfish in the sense of self-centered, but selfish in the sense of, I need to grow spiritually. I need to apply these things. What's in it for me? Well, on top of that, yes, sir. usually when I'm developing my lesson, I'm, I'm asking the question, you know, what do I need to hear? Because if I need to hear it, surely there's somebody else out there that needs to hear it also. Probably so. You're not so unique that you're the only one the Word of God will apply to. Good point. <laughs> Thank you. So the, the Word is meant to be heard than read. Yes. Do you want to say something about that or something yes. else about that? Yes. I was actually else? going to ask you to repeat that. Um, I wanted to hear it again. But then do you mean in the sense that it's the intended audience and how they would have perceived? That's part of it. And the words being used or the parable being presented, that sort of thing? Yes. Okay. The audience is, is important. We need to analyze yes. not just the speaker in the words, the language and the contexts, but also the hearers. What did they need to hear? What were, they, what were the issues that they were addressing? I agree. But it was yeah. written in such a way, what I'm trying to say is that beyond that, it's written in such a way that it was written for the ear, not for the eye. They did not have a printing press then. And if, if they did, hardly anyone could have read it anyway because they didn't know they were mostly illiterate. I saw a bumper sticker that once that said, illiterate, write today for free help. So, <laughs> all right, you're gonna get that during lunch, some of you. Yes, Sarah. You said most of what I was going to say, um, but also when we think about an oral culture like that, where everything was written down to be heard, not seen, you're also talking about a very communal culture. They would have gathered together to hear it. Uh, it wouldn't have just been us sitting in our bedroom reading it, because like you said, most of them couldn't read. The re idea that we can all read is a very, very modern concept. Um, and so we also have to consider how did the audience as a whole act, not just how did it impact us. We're very individualistic as a society, but in that time they were very communal. So how did that affect the community, not just us? So if it's written for the ear, and it's obviously going to be read in the community gathering, then what would the author have intended for the, the whole community of God, the church, the assembly, to apply? Not just, I am as an individual, what do I personally need to hear? But also, maybe even more importantly, what does the church as a whole need to hear? Is that what you're saying? Basically, and it also builds into the idea that God is the God of community, is a God of relationship. We're not, I mean, yes, we're supposed to have a relationship between us and God, and that's very important. Yay. We're also supposed to have that relationship between the group, and so reading it as a group, having that repetition in the ear instead of in the eye, allows us as a group to build those core relationships and use God to build relationships with each other. Ah, I love that point. Thank you. So as we look at the question, what does this do to my, rela my relationship with God, as that strengthens what automatically begins to happen in our relationship with each other. And as we hear it together, what is the natural thing for the church to do when we hear the word of God together? Is to talk about it with each other about what we just heard. And not just talk about the deliverer. There are some people that can't wait to leave the building to have roast preacher on their way to lunch. Whoever the preacher happens to be, right? <laughs> 
So to hear the word spoken leads us to, now, did I hear him correctly? Did I hear her say this correctly in the assembly, in our small group discussion? And so you're discussing with each other the word. You're testing it out with each other. How does that fit with what we understand? And you go through the Old Covenant Scriptures to understand. But, of course, in the New Testament, when it was written, as it was being written, it was read collectively to the church, right? Everyone didn't have their own personal Bibles here or especially here. We are so personalized in our walk with Jesus and part of the movement of the Jesus revolution in the 60s and 70s. Do you remember the what was the the major push against that movement? Personal relationship with Jesus. It is you can't ignore the church relationship with Jesus because in that movement it was. Jesus, yes, the church, no. It was a total anti-organizational, anti-institutional, anti-authoritarian movement. It was swept up as part of a larger movement of the 50s and 60s. The basis of that movement was a bit different, I think. But are you, are you with me historically? You know what I'm talking Some of you don't. Others of you, some of you are not old enough to remember. Others of you are too old to remember. So, <laughs> and some of you aren't hearing what I'm saying anyway. <laughs> but you watch the movie, The Jesus Revolution, and, you, and you'll have a, uh, an idea of what was going on in the 70s, 60s and 70s, and the mass revival around the country, if not around the world. Yes, sir. What I remember from, let me see, I would have been anywhere from 5 to 11 in the timeline for which you speak, is that I do remember the anger towards the church that pushed to make sure that we did meet together so that we could be part of that body of Christ with the relationship to Christ with the Spirit and the Father. And that was, I can still remember that because people would still, and they do today, say, oh, you attend, do you attend the Church of Christ? And that's, that's not a compliment from <laughs> coming from them because they think that we're very rigid about our relationship with one another. Very what now? Rigid. Rigid, as in narrow and straight. And so there is a rigidness to the relationship with God, and yet there is a tradition-bound legalistic relig- rigidness that is part of our heritage. Whether we like that or not, that's been part of our history. And we need to be careful with that and look through, well, we'll see in a minute. So in, in this, at least I think we will, um, we see this as to what does it say about the Father, what does it say about the Son, and what does it say about the Spirit. Glance down to just below the five questions, pursue Jesus. I have that separate and not even as one of the bullet points for a reason. I'd like you to figure why you think I did that that, that way. All right? I think the, you put it in the wrong place. I'll say it again? I think you put it in the wrong place. Why is that? Shouldn't that be up at the top? No. <laughs> <laughs> it is. What does it say about the Father, the Son, and, and the Spirit? And, and I... I want you to hear this carefully. Jesus is the embodiment of the Father, Son, and Spirit in this way. He is the fullness of God. Yet he is the Son, as the Son, is not the Father, but he embodies the fullness of the Father. I have no clue what I just said, but I believe it's true. I can't explain it fully. But he has the fullness of the Holy Spirit though he himself is not the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is the Lord, though the Holy Spirit is not Jesus and Jesus is not the Spirit. They are, in a sense, the same because they are completely the same substance and essence and purpose and guide. And they are the being of God in three who are one and one who are three. Now explain that to me. And you get a PhD from most seminaries, a cemetery, seminaries in, in, in the country if not the world. Um, Jesus was walking with the disciples of Emmaus after the resurrection, and they didn't recognize him. 
And so he, he said he was going to keep walking, and they said, well, come and stay with us. And so they did, and then he took the bread, and he broke it, and he blessed it, and suddenly their eyes were opened, and suddenly Jesus was gone. The disciples of em, em, Emmaus, am I pronouncing that correctly? Um, they were so, the two were so excited. Did our hearts not burn within us? This is the Jesus that we saw killed. And in Luke chapter 24, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself, by the way, the disciples were, those two disciples were meeting with the 12. Well, not the 12. Well, I guess the 12, because Matthias would have been there too. So the future 12, the 11. And, and they're explaining to them how they had just, <laughs> they had just eaten with Jesus. And the disciples are listening to the two say their, tell their story. And suddenly, verse 36, they were talking about these things. Jesus himself stood among them. And he said to them, peace, shalom, peace to you. And they were startled and frightened. You would be too if suddenly there was somebody who stood here who wasn't here beside me. And he said, peace to you. And, and you, you saw, and then you recognized that's Jesus himself. Yeah, I think you'd be pretty startled. And wouldn't you feel a bit frightened, especially if you saw this man just die a few days before? <clears throat> okay, so they were startled and frightened, and they thought they had seen a ghost, a spirit, and they said, uh, he said, why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your heart? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for the joy and were marveling, he said, you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and he ate it before them. Which indicates what, by the way? What, what? I'm reading this out loud. Are you seeing some of this happen in your mind? The power of the writ, the red word of God. You just, are you visualizing the story as you're reading it yourself, perhaps? Anybody? Is that a nod of a yes, or are you just kind of glazed over because the story? Cause, okay. And he said to them, "These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything, writ, every everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled." Then he opened their mind to understand the scriptures. I think a shorthand for, he took them through Genesis through Malachi and showed them how the scriptures all indicated who he is and that all of this was going to happen, his suffering and death and resurrection. And then he opened their minds and uh, they had to understand the scriptures and said, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that the repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his names to all nations, his name in all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of the Father upon you, and stay in the city until you are clothed with power on high. And he led them out to Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them, and he ascended into heaven. He parted, he, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him there. And then they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God for 10 days. They were in the temple blessing God, and then on the day of Pentecost, we know they were in the upper room, tongues of fire, sound of mighty rushing wind, but here's the point I want to get to here. What did Jesus say all of the Old Testament was about? Yeah. Him. Him. Pursue Jesus. The passages of Scripture that we're dealing with, if you're preaching specific things, also, if you're learning specific, ask of the text, what does this say about? Not just the Father, not just the Son, not just the Spirit, but also specifically about Jesus himself. Let, let that question I'll swear to one, oh no, ruminate. <laughs> Keep coming up until you've fully digested the text to see Jesus more clearly. 
I, um, you remember when the Philip came alongside the chariot with the Ethiopian treasure? Where was the treasurer reading? Anybody know? Okay, Old Testament, specifically, specifically 53, and it says he took that passage of scripture and immediately began telling him about Jesus. Could he have done that with nearly any Old Testament scripture? Yeah. He could have worked that through because, you see, the Old Covenant scriptures were written to give wisdom that salvation is in Christ. Paul said that in Timothy. That's not me just saying that. So the scriptures were written for the ear, not for the eye. It doesn't mean you don't gain anything from reading and reading silently. It does mean that you may gain a lot more by reading and reading it out loud. So here's the challenge as we approach the book of Hebrews together. And this is a challenge to everyone, not just those who are going to be preaching. But if you were in the preaching part of the class, prep and delivery. By the way, that, that class is open to anybody who wants to come. But if you, uh, if you are part of that group and or you want to go deeper in the book of Hebrews, here's the challenge. Read Hebrews through page 1 to page 13 in one sitting out loud every day for the next week. It might take 30 minutes. Read it, and read it, not just read it, but read it with meaning. Read it, you see, Hebrews was written as a sermon to be delivered, and it's more of an outline than a full text. We have Hebrews, and I say that because as you read Hebrews, you're going to see quotations from the Old Testament. And you have the Hebrew writer say something like this, and it's, I'm going to paraphrase now. And it seems the Spirit said someplace. <laughs> and then he quotes an obscure passage of Scripture out, what seems to be out of its context, and applies it to Jesus. But to the original Hebrew Christian hearers, they would have gone to that passage of Scripture in their mind because they grew up hearing it but not just that verse by itself or that verse connected to 20 other verses everywhere else. But they heard it read as the Psalms or as a passage from Isaiah, Genesis. They heard it read, Joshua, Judges, in the context of the synagogue. And they grew up hearing this read. So when they heard Isaiah 2, one verse quoted, in their minds, they would go immediately to the entire passage of, of Psalm 2. Let's say Psalm, Psalm 2. Isaiah 2, they would go immediately to the full passage, at least surrounding that verse that was quoted, because they didn't have chapters and verses then. That wasn't until about a thousand years later, I think, into our movement, the Christian movement. Okay. So what does this text say about The Father, the Son, the Spirit, what does this text reveal about me? What does it tell me about me physically? Is there any passage of Scripture that talks about us physically? Is there anything that refers to our physical bodies in the the Bible? What's that? Okay, we are the temple of God. There's the, the application to me. My body actually is a temple that the Holy Spirit of God literally lives inside. And so there's some applications to that, right? Sexual purity is one of them, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Communion of the Holy Spirit, the whole body of Christ is the temple of God. So don't go, dis- don't go dividing the body of Christ because whoever destroys the temple... God will destroy him. That context is unity, not physical body. I grew up here in a physical body. I don't know if you did or not. That's why, we, that's why we're told never to smoke, drink, or chew, or date girls who do. That you, you don't do those things because they hurt your body, and whoever destroys your body is going to be destroyed by God because the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. In principle, that might be true, but that's not what that verse is saying. Look at it in its context 1 Corinthians 3 is talking about the unity of the church. 
you don't go messing with the unity of the church or God's going to be messing with you. That's what that passage says. Okay, so your body physically is the temple of the Spirit, plus our body collectively, the church, is a temple of the Spirit. But there are some other things about the body that we learn, like it's important what you eat. It's important that you rest. Jesus told his disciples after they came back on their 10-city tour that he sent them out two by two. They came back to say, the demons even responded to us, Jesus. This is incredible. I mean, we were healing the sick. We were proclaiming the kingdom, and the demons even responded. And Jesus said, don't rejoice because of that. I saw Satan being cast out of heaven. And I think he was saying, at this point, he was, it's a metaphor, but he's seeing Satan being defeated. And the disciples are excited. And but Jesus has just gotten news about something else that wasn't nearly so happily or joyfully exciting. Do you remember what that piece of information was? John the Baptist had just been killed and his head had been removed from his body and placed on a silver platter. And the disciples came to, John's disciples came to tell Jesus the bad news while the disciples were coming to tell Jesus the good news. Think for just a moment how Jesus is feeling at that point emotionally what he knows is happening spiritually, what his journey to Jerusalem is about to entail. All of this is now coming down intellectually. He's piecing all of this together. Jesus is having to deal with all of this as a human being, as well as the spirit-filled, God-embodied man. We have that combination. Okay, so that and the disciples, and he sees how many thousands are coming to the middle of the desert now? About five. Why are they coming out? Men coming out without women and children. Literally, the text says without women and children. And that's not including, it's not like, well, there had to be about 10,000 then. It's not, there were 5,000 men, not including women and children, but rather 5,000 men, not including, there weren't any there. There were just 5,000 men. What are they doing out in the middle of the desert? They just heard about the kingdom of God is almost here. The Messiah has arrived. The kingdom is going to be established. They're coming out ready for battle. So we have multiple disciple, potential disciples coming out to the desert. Jesus is meeting with the 12. They're excited. He's both. And he says, come apart from them and let's rest. That one line is in Mark. Come apart from them and let's rest. Is there something there to, that we can apply physically to ourselves? Think hard. Do we need rest physically? Do we need rest emotionally, intellectually, spiritually? Do we need to take a time to catch our breath and rest? Come apart from them. And so a friend of mine said it this way. Come apart from them or you will. <laughs> Come apart or you will. That's all. Thank you. I was going to say is the, the other aspect of what our bodies are is, is that the flesh is weak. The flesh is weak. Yes. Thinking and, of the Garden of Gethsemane. Yes. And you and I, I guess it's not a joke, but uh, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Not He doesn't ask me to sit down so often, but he maketh me lie down. If you don't choose to lie down and rest, the shepherd will choose for you to make you lie down and rest. Thank you for bringing that out. Charlie Shedd wrote a book called Guide Psychiatry, and he said he was speaking so often that he, was, he had a point of exhaustion, and so he ended up in the hospital. His best friend in the world came and sat down in the hospital room with him for 30 minutes and did not say a single word. And as he got up, he start, got to the door, he stopped, and he said, Charlie, he makes me to lie down. And he left. Charlie had not taken any time for personal rest, so he hit the point of exhaustion. What good is he lying in the bed like that to anyone? Take care of yourself physically. God gave you a body. Don't ignore that. Do the things that are necessary for your personal health. It might help you stay around a little longer. It might keep your mind a little more clearer. Maybe. Some of you are well beyond help there. But some, 
And so it might help you keep your heart more emotionally, the things you eat, the exercise you have. Or if we don't do those things, what are we doing with what God's given us? So take care of the body you're given. And, (coughs) excuse me, Scripture teaches that kind of thing. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear, asking the question, what does this reveal to me physically, emotionally, spiritually, intellectually? So I write those down. You, you can explore that further. Any questions or comments or, or examples you want to give? Anybody? By the way, if there's something you want to take us on a rabbit trail, you say, wait, but what about this? And you want to ask a different kind of question, please interrupt. We don't have to go the direction that I personally have prepared because I believe the Spirit of God works within the body of Christ to help us all grow together. So if there's something you see that's important, please bring that out. Questions, comments, disagreements? I encourage you to think when you're, if you disagree with me, say so. I don't mind at all. I figure you're wrong about so many other things as well. All right, is there a promise here for me to claim? That's an important question. There are certain rocks you find in Scripture, huge, bolder rocks and smaller rocks, but they're huge rocks upon which you can pull together, or you can pull them together, and upon which you can now build your life. What I mean by that is there are certain certainties, certain certainties that God said is true whether or you can see it or not. It is true. What is one of those certainties that is true whether you see it or not? Is there a God? Anyone who comes to God must first... I'm I'm now quoting Hebrews 11, verse 6. If you want to look it up, if you don't know it, anyone who comes to God must first believe... Read it aloud. Believe... He exists and he is, say it again louder, rewarder of those who, and the word was earnestly, earnestly, diligently, seriously seek after him. When you approach scripture, when you approach life, You start with the foundational block, the cornerstone. There is a God. He is alive. In Him we live. And we do thrive. I've changed the words because I think we do more than just survive. So you hear me sing that, we do thrive, because I think we do more than just survive. Okay, that's my point. And He's not somewhere beyond the blue because He has revealed Himself. He's not concealed from human sight. He has revealed himself to human sight. So I sing, he, there is beyond the azure blue a God revealed to human sight. I just try to make it biblically correct, that's all, personally. <laughs> what does any of that matter? Nothing at all. That was a zinger just to kind of pull you back into the class, all right? Um, is there a promise? Are there solid promises of God? Abraham, leave your family everything that's there, pack it up, pack up what you need, and go. I will, what? I will bless you. How will I bless you, God says? I will lead you to, what? Okay, I'm going to multiply your family. (laughs) You can't count the stars, you can't count the sand. That's how many descendants you're going to have. But he says, initially, Genesis 12, I want you to leave your family, everything that you have. I want you to take the stuff with you. You will travel now to where? A land that I'm going to give you, right? Did Abraham know where he was going? No. Did God say that he knew where he was going? So Abraham, Abram at the time becomes Abraham. Abram says, I can't see that but I trust you who can. Faith is the evidence of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for. So Abraham's not just blindly stepping out, okay, God, but rather evidence upon whom what God has done. So he has a discussion with God. He says, hey, look, you promised me children. It's been a while now, and I don't have any kids. 
It's going to be my, my servant or my, my nephew. Who, who are you going to, how are you going to fulfill this promise? And God says, step outside. So all this is happening inside the tent. Step outside. Now, count the stars. How many, this is how many kids you're going to have. How many descendants you're going to, it's going to come out of you. There's, there's a process God is taking him through so that he will have evidence of something he cannot see. What is the evidence? What's his reasoning that's not clearly stated, but obviously there? See? He has a plan. He has a plan. And the evidence of that is, when he said count the stars, and Abraham began counting, and he said, that's how many children you're going to have. And the very next verse says, and Abram believed God, and it was counted to him, it was accredited to him as righteousness. God says, you were right with me because you trust me to do what I said I would do, even though you can't see it, you have still seen it. What evidence is there that God will give him children when he told him, count the stars? What's the missing part of this reasoning statement? Let me take it this way. God is saying, without saying the words, if you're counting the stars, Abram, who put those up there? Who, who created the stars? Okay, if I did that, can I do this? Do you see now the connection with what Abram is doing? He's counting the stars and he says, that's how many kids you're going to have. He said, oh, and, and it's, I'm going to say suddenly he sees something and he says, I believe you, God. And from that day forward, he's stepping into the promise of God. So much so that he tries to rush it in a little bit with Hagar. <laughs> and, and I think as we look at it, looking back, the flesh is weak. He looks at, we look back at that and say, he took the flesh approach to the promise of God and not the promise approach that God had intended. But it was 25 years later that God fulfilled that promise. Because it was then that Sarah conceived and had the baby. Isaac which means, ha ha. Yes, sir. The evidence you're talking about that he saw was his belief. Say it again. The evidence that uh, you're talking about, that you're referring to with Abraham. Yes. Was his belief. The evidence was not the belief. The evidence produced the belief. Faith is, is the evidence of things not seen. So the evidence then was the stars? The you evidence, still haven't revealed what you're thinking the evidence was. The evidence were the stars. Okay. The belief is, well, if God can do that, he can do this. And then Hebrews even says, and whenever he was going to offer his own son Isaac, like God had commanded him to, he trusted that God would, would still use Isaac. Well, how could you do that? Because he believed that God would even resurrect Isaac from the dead. And then the Hebrew writer says, and in a sense he did. How long did it take Abraham to travel to Mount Moriah to offer Isaac? Three days. When Abraham decided, I'm going to kill my son to obey God, in his mind, in his heart, his son had died. He just hadn't fulfilled it yet. Three days later, he receives his son back. You think he's excited and happy? Do you think maybe he saw something way in the future? A correlation. A correlation and something is planted in Abraham and I see these words, I hear these words. Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. And they said, you're not even 50 years old. How could Abraham see your day? And I think here is one case where Abraham saw most clearly the death and resurrection of the Son of God. Because he himself had experienced, and the promise of God is sure. So what is this? Is there a promise for me to claim? Not every promise in the Bible that's given is a promise for you to personally claim. 
Raise up your staff and I will split the Red Sea. He did not tell you to do that. Don't go out and try it. That's not your promise. That was Moses, okay? So not every promise that you're... You can't read and say, like the guy, here's where we're going to end. Here's the, the danger of a topical sermon or a thematic sermon. It's okay, God, what do you want me to know? Judas went out and hanged himself. Surely not, God. Surely not. No, what? Go and do likewise. No, God, certainly. What, what, do, you want, what do you want from me? Quickly. Whatever you do, do quickly. <laughs> Be careful of the verse and the verse and the verse and the verse, putting them together to make your argument. Be sure, if you're going to do that, be sure to look at each passage in their context that you're convinced they really do fit together and not just something that our heritage has put together, but you be convinced that's what Scripture actually says. Argue with our past, argue with our present, and argue with yourself. Do I really know what this word says? And we're done. I see some of you ready to get up because the, the bell did ring. I'm sorry, I want to go over. No one ever does that.